Good morning, everyone. This is part of the Palm Springs Air Museum uh, recorded history of the veterans of World War II. It's a Library of Congress program, and the record of our veteran will be at the Palm Springs Air Museum at the Library of Congress. And this is honoring our veterans from World War II, including civilians and actually uh, all forms of the service. Today, uh, we're here. I am Don Ahrens, a volunteer docent and uh, interviewer from the Palm Springs Air Museum, and Megan is our note taker. And we're very pleased to have World War II veteran Robert Van Ness. Bob, would you please spell your name and give your birthday? Well, it's uh, Robert Van Ness, R O B E R T V A N. Capital N E S T. Birthday? Uh, June 29th, 1921. Where were you born? I was born in Wyndham, Minnesota. Population 2100. Where were your folks from? Well, my father was also born in Wyndham, Minnesota, and my mother came from another town in Minnesota, Lake City, Minnesota. What was their background, or do you, you're like your grandparents and your heritage? Well, my father had been in World War I. He was a lieutenant in World War, uh, World War I. He had gone to Shattuck Military Academy and was a lieutenant. Uh, my mother uh, grew up and was a school teacher in Wyndham. Uh, when when they met, my grandparents uh, came uh, to Wyndham from Minneapolis uh, because their father, who would be my great grandfather, was one of the uh, uh, founders of the Northwestern Railroad, uh, which ran at that time from Omaha, Nebraska, to Minneapolis, and. Uh, they got every other section of land on either side of the track for three miles, and his uh, uh, part of that land happened to fall in Wyndham, and that's how my grandfather wound up in Wyndham, Minnesota from Minneapolis. How about brothers and sisters? Well, I had two brothers, uh, Dean, who is two years younger than I am, uh, he was also in the service in the Navy, and uh, Brad, uh, who was 11 years uh, younger than I, he served in the Korean War. What was it like growing up? What do you remember from your early life when you started school? And Well, it was a depression time. Uh, I grew up uh, uh, in my high school days were in the early 30s and um, it was uh, a typical small town. Uh, I played uh, football and basketball. Uh, not much golf, although we did have a little nine-hole golf course there. Uh, it was a, a typical small town uh, type of life. Our dating night happened to be Sunday night when we tended to go to the movies, and uh, I, I don't, there wasn't anything particularly unusual about it, I wouldn't say. Can you remember any high school girlfriends or oh, good yes. friends? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember several of them. Very nice girls. I'm not sure where they are now. Yeah. But uh, uh, the, the one that I later married, I didn't meet until after the war was over. So. Uh, none of my uh, none of my high school sweethearts uh, remained uh, with me later. So, did you have a job or a, a bicycle, or had you gotten into cars yet? Or, well, my father was a, an automobile dealer, oh. he, and so I learned to drive at a very early age. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, my mother took me out to teach me how to drive when I was nine years old. And <clears throat> when I was 11 years old, uh, we used to bring cars in from Detroit to Duluth, Minnesota on the top of ore boats. 
And then we would drive from Wyndham to Duluth, which was about 300 miles. And then we would drive a new car and tow a second car behind us uh, back to Wyndham. I did that when I was 11 years old, uh, which seems strange now, but I remember very well I was only 11. At that time, they didn't seem to worry too much about uh, whether you had a driver's license or not. What kind of cars were they? Well, my dad was a, a, a Dodge Plymouth dealer, and uh, so they were mostly, uh, they were either Dodges or Plymouths. And, uh, but I actually remember very well, I learned to drive in an old uh, uh, 19, uh, it was a 1927 Chevrolet that uh, was a used car. My dad let my mother use it, and that's how she taught me how to drive. <clears throat> Did you have any favorite subjects in high school or that anything you were starting to get interested in at the time? Uh, not, I wouldn't say, I was very interested in athletics because my dad had played football for the national championship team at Minnesota University uh, in 1915. Uh, so we were always very interested in athletics. I was a, a better than average student, but not the top student. And uh, it was just a, a known uh, uh, fact that I was going to go to the university. I never thought of any other place to go. Uh, everybody I knew went there. And uh, it was just a fact that, that when I got out of high school, I'd be going to the university. What was the name of the high school? Wyndham, Wyndham High School. Okay. And uh, we, uh, won our district one year in uh, basketball, and we were undefeated one year in football, which was a big thing in the town. Uh, and we all got, I remember, a little gold uh, footballs for being undefeated that year. Yeah. When did you graduate, and then did you go right into the university? <clears throat> I graduated in 1939 in June. And yes, I went into the University of Minnesota in the fall of 39. What did you uh, major in or what did... Uh... I went into the business school and I uh, wound up getting a degree, a BBA degree, Bachelor of Business Administration. Yeah. I, my major was Personnel and Industrial Relations. Yeah. How big was your class then? At the university? Mm -hmm. Your business class. Well, I don't know if you just mean my the business school classes. Mm -hmm. Well, that probably might have, I, I, be, I, maybe 100 or 150 wasn't, uh, wasn't big. Now, my whole university class was, was sizable because at the time I think there were about 15,000 students at the oh. university. Yeah. So we were several thousand people at least in my class then. You know, being in business school in 1939-40, did they talk about the country's economy or what was the feeling then? It, yes, there was a lot of talk of the economy. Uh, I felt at the time that uh, the professors we had were uh, extremely liberal in their views. Uh, however, my father was a very staunch Democrat and uh, uh, a great uh, follower of Franklin Roosevelt. So yeah, there were talks because we were just starting maybe to come out of the Depression a little bit in 39 and, and 40 when I started. Where were you on Pearl Harbor Day and what were you doing? Uh, I was uh, at the university. I was a junior and I was over at our fraternity house. It was a Sunday, I remember. Uh, I, uh, I was not staying in the house at the time. I was living at home. Uh, but uh, I remember being over there on the Sunday when uh, we heard the we heard the news. What did you think about it? Did you start thinking about the service or were you worried about uh, 
draft age? Well, <clears throat> everybody knew they had to uh, serve in some way, and uh, it took uh, maybe a matter of a, a, a month or six weeks be, to kind of settle it out in your mind what you wanted to do. Uh, I chose uh, the Navy uh, for several reasons. One of them was it seemed like no matter where you were in battle, you had a decent place to sleep and you always had a decent meal to get. And uh, so I chose the Navy and uh, they had a program then uh, called V7 and uh, I joined V7, which was great because it allowed you to finish out your, uh, your senior year and get your regular degree before you went into the service. So you finished your degree and then you went in the service and what were the years on that? Well, I went, I, I graduated in the summer or spring of, of uh, 1943 and uh, then in the fall I went into officer's training school at Northwestern University. I was, uh, as they called it at the time, uh, a 90-day wonder. Uh, a lot of uh, the real Navy guys called it a 90-day blunder. <laughs> but uh, I, I was there for about three months in the, in the fall of 43 and got my uh, 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 lieutenant, I was graduated as an ensign at the end of that time. And then what was your next step? Well, my next step was uh, that I was transferred to the Supply Corps and uh, I went to, uh, uh, to Harvard University then, uh, Harvard uh, Business School, uh, in the supply uh, training program that they had, which was uh, uh, approximately another uh, 90 days, I think it was a little bit more than that, that I was out at, I um, remember it, uh, Morris E33 I stayed at in, uh, uh, at Harvard University. Yeah. You're an exception in the fact you've been to three great universities, Minnesota, Northwestern, and Harvard. And how did that hit you as a, as a, a young man growing up? Were there differences between them and the culture or? Well, the, the Northwestern and Harvard experiences were not maybe normal college experience. We used their facilities, uh, but the most of the, and we used some of their instructors, but most of the instruction was by Navy people. We were basically using their facilities, but I, I wouldn't call the the Northwestern or Harvard uh, experience as a typical uh, college experience. Mm -hmm. It was basically a Navy experience in, a, in, in, in using their facilities. Did you have any, I, I use the term boot training, I, officers probably didn't have boot training the same way, but was that the next step in the Navy or how, would, how did your assignments work through that? Well, no, what boot training you had was in the, in the first 90 days. You uh, originally you went in as a as a seaman second class, I believe it was, and you you were that for like a month or so before you then you became a midshipman, and then at the end of that time you you became an ensign if you, if you lasted that long. And then out of Harvard Business School, or you went actually directly to a ship, or did yeah, you actually? Yeah, it, uh, it was rather interesting because, uh, and I probably was a little lucky because at, at, at going back to Northwestern, I'm not sure how many were in the class I was in. I would have to estimate it at maybe five or 600 uh, men in that class. And there were only two of us that were selected out of that class uh, to go to Harvard. And I happened to be one of them. The rest of them all went to uh, 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 
Little Creek, Virginia, I believe it was, to the amphibious training uh, school. So almost all that class went into amphibs, uh, but I did go to Harvard. Now, when we got done with Harvard, uh, uh, it was kind of a, a fun session. Everybody put down what kind of a ship they wanted to get or what kind of duty they wanted. Uh, I put down a heavy cruiser. Uh, it, now guys were putting down battleships, uh, aircraft carriers, no one was thinking of amphibs or anything of that sort. Well, they finally announced these and by golly, I got a heavy cruiser, the CA-24, which was the USS Pensacola. Why did you pick a heavy cruiser? Was there something that appealed to you about it? or? I don't know, to be honest with you. I knew I wanted a big ship uh, of some sort. I didn't think there was much ever chance of getting on an aircraft carrier or a battleship. And uh, so I, uh, I, I, I chose a cruiser, which was the next thing down. <clears throat> You're on the way to a heavy cruiser, and what were your impressions when you first saw the ship? Well, <laughs> it's so long ago I've kind of I've probably forgotten. I had chased it around for uh, a while to, to catch it, uh, and I finally uh, caught it in Guam. And uh, it was sitting there with uh, the other two cruisers in our division. Uh, we were what was called Cruiser Division 5, which com was comprised of three ships actually the Pensacola, the USS Chester, and the USS Salt Lake City. And they were, uh, the three of them were sitting there. They were all pre-war ships, uh, but big, and uh, it was kind of exciting, really. And uh, I think my, yeah, I, it was not like going on a cruise ship, really, yeah. but it was, it was an exciting time, yes. Did you fly in uh, to, to no, pick no. them up? No, I uh, uh, went to San Francisco from school, and unfortunately they uh, were, were backed up on transportation of new officers to the Pacific. And unfortunately uh, they had to billet us uh, for about three weeks in the penthouse of the Clift Hotel. Uh, and I was with uh, three other fellows, and we had the penthouse of the of the cliff. It also happened that that's the the hotel that all the airlines uh, used, so there was a big supply of of a, uh, of uh, flight attendants, I guess I should say. Now we said stewardesses at the time, and uh, so we did have uh, uh, three weeks, and we were ready to go to war. <laughs> after the three weeks at the Cliff Hotel. Then we did, we got on a, a victory ship in San Francisco and went straight to Guam and that's where I where I caught the, the Pensacola. And uh, what was going on in the war at that time uh, when you came into it on a combat basis? Well they were just com basically mopping up the Guam operation uh, and they had just completed Saipan and Tinian just prior to that time. So by the time I got there, Guam was pretty well secured, uh, and they were planning the Iwo invasion, but at that time I had never heard of Iwo. I didn't even know about it at that time. But it was at, at the, the final conclusion of Guam. There were still a few pockets of of uh, Japanese on uh, Guam, but uh, basically that, those operations were pretty well sealed up and they were just kind of uh, pausing uh, before starting the next one. And then did you go into combat as a task force? Were you tied in or were you more... Uh... Well, we, we had a, a funny situation. Our cruiser division five was <clears throat> to be the softening up uh, division for, uh, for EWO. And 
we made about four different sortes, you might say, where we went from Guam to Iwo and we circled the island and unloaded all the ammunition we could onto the island. Uh, we had kind of assumed at the conclusion of that that there wouldn't possibly be a person alive left on Iwo Jima. Uh, and then we went back to Guam and uh, they prepared for the major in invasion, which was to come in February. We were going up to Iwo in October, November, and December of the previous of the previous year. Your first combat experience then came at Iwo Jima. Yeah, the first yes, that's true. The first real combat experience came at Iwo Jima, and uh, uh, this was several days prior to the landing. The landing at Iwo Jima was to be the 19th of February, uh, 1945. And uh, uh, we arrived uh, at Iwo about four days prior to this, the whole task force, and the whole task force including battleships and other cruisers and destroyers and the whole the whole fleet almost, uh, circled the island and had about four days of bombardment. Now, our, uh, in our case, our, our real battle uh, damage, you might say that, occurred when <clears throat> there was one uh, uh, set of batteries uh, that was in a cave uh, overlooking the landing area that for some reason nobody could knock out because they would come out and take a shot and then they would roll back into the cave. <clears throat> so the admirals got together and decided that somebody uh, had to go in close enough where they had to come out and at that point the rest of the fleet would target in and knock out this battery. I'm not sure whether the admirals got together and drew straws as to see who was going to do it, but it wound up that it was going to be the Pensacola. And <clears throat> our normal range of guns was about 10,000 yards. 10 or 9 or 10,000 yards. So <clears throat> the thought was that if we got into six or seven, they probably would come out uh, and, uh, uh, and, and they could be destroyed. So anyway, on the 17th of February, which was two days prior to the landing, uh, our time arrived when we were going to make this uh, uh, as a decoy. Uh, running into uh, in, into shore. So I remembered very well. We started off, and uh, from the bridge they were announcing our our distance in, and we started off at about twelve thousand yards. Finally, we got to ten. They kept working down. It was nine thousand, eight thousand. Nothing was happening. No one was coming out. Finally, we got down to 6,000. We wondered, where were they? Maybe, maybe they weren't there. Uh, and we kept going, 5,000. And everybody, every 1,000 yards, somebody was telling us how close. Finally, we got down to 4,000. We were getting nervous. Uh, 3,000. We finally got into 2,000 yards, which is almost point blank for a cruiser. And <clears throat> out they came, and they hit us with shore batteries five times prior to anyone knocking them out. We finally, the rest of the ships and us, uh, finally did destroy th that gun emplacement. Uh, but they hit us five times. They killed a number of our shipmates. I can't remember at this point. I think it was 
I think it was 10 that were killed uh, and a number wounded badly uh, before we, uh, it, it all happened very quickly and uh, uh, it was over and we pulled out and they said, well, we just, we destroyed the gun emplacement and uh, that was our major battle in at Iwo when we had some people killed and when we had some severe damage to the ship. Weren't, was, weren't you injured? Well, <laughs> yeah, I was injured, uh, theoretically. Uh, I had a five-inch shell that landed within about three feet of where I was standing. Uh, I was inside, uh, I, I, my battle station was in the decoding room, which was above CIC, which is our combat information center. The combat information center is the heart of the ship. That's where all of the radar is. That's where every, that's, that's really where the ship was run from and in a battle mode. Uh, the uh, uh, decoding room was right above that. I was in the decoding room. A five-inch shell landed, but fortunately for me, not for others, uh, it was an armor-piercing shell, and it went right through the deck, exploding at the deck below us, and that's where all of the, it, it completely destroyed our CIC room, and it uh, that's where most of the deaths uh, uh, occurred. Now, some of the shrapnel from that came up, through the deck, and I had a very slight injury uh, to one leg from uh, shrapnel. Now, I had to be treated by the medics, and of course anyone that was treated by the medics uh, did get a Purple Heart. Uh, some of my uh, colleagues that used to uh, uh, kid me aboard ship said that I was the only person that received a Purple Heart or his wounds were taken care of with a Band-Aid. <laughs> but it was not quite that simple, but it was not a major injury. I had some shrapnel in my right leg, which was uh, removed and uh, healed up and no problem from it. And you stayed on duty the whole time through all that? You weren't in sick oh, yes. bay for... I did. As a matter of fact, uh, our my commanding officer of my division was seriously wounded and had to be taken from the ship. All of our wounded were taken off uh, that night. Well, we buried our dead first and then the, uh, the wounded were taken off, which was another very sad story because they were, all these wounded were put down in an in a uh, uh, amphibious uh, uh, ship, and t to go to the hospital ship. In the meantime, the hospital ship came under bombardment and had to move, and so these men floated around all night and till the next morning, uh, uh, and several of them. Were, were very near death. I don't believe any of them died as a result of this. Uh, but uh, my commanding officer, my division, was one taken and I had to take his place for about uh, two or three months until a replacement, his replacement, came aboard. Well, that was just the beginning, right? Because the next thing you, what, came under uh, attack by a miniature submarine? No, that was in Okinawa. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the rest of our time at Iwo, uh, we, we had a segment of the shore where we bombarded constantly for about 10 days. And it was uh, above where our uh, Marines were landing. Uh, and we, we uh, for 24 hours a day, we fired our, our guns at these uh, uh, em embankments and so forth uh, above where our Marines were trying to get ashore. 
And then at that point, uh, they had to remove us to get some temporary repairs because we were operating with no CIC and we were just kind of shooting blind. And how was that a 10,000 range? And what were the size of the guns? 10 inch. 10 inch. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the pre war cruisers had bigger guns. The later uh, cruisers that came on during the war uh, were 8 inch guns, but we did have 10. Then you went to Okinawa, and what? After we were repaired, and it wasn't a full repair, we. <coughs> We went to Okinawa. Uh, Iwo had been pretty well secured by that time, and we we went on uh, to Okinawa for for the landing there. That's right. And you you said you had an attack. Is that where the submarine was involved? Well, we were attacked both ways at, at Iwo. At Iwo, as you may remember, there were a lot of kamikaze uh, attacks. Uh, I remember one day when they said there were 900 kamikazes that took off that day uh, for our fleet. Uh, Fortunately for us, we were never hit by a kamikaze. All the ships around us were. The Indianapolis was near us, another heavy cruiser. It was hit by a kamikaze. There were almost all of the uh, destroyers around us were hit. For some reason, they, they missed the Pensacola. Uh, we had a patrol station where we were patrolling about, uh, I'm not sure of the length, it might have been like a five mile stretch of beach that was our uh, area to patrol. And we would, we would cruise at about three knots uh, an hour, about, about three knots speed. And uh, we would go bombard all the way down, and then we would turn around at the end and come back. We just kept going back and forth. Each ship had a a segment that they were that was their area. It was during that time that we were attacked by miniature subs. Uh, it was just one of those unbelievable situations where uh, we were on our on our bombardment run, we uh, were just at the end of it. Now, we're just barely moving. We're just r ready to make our turn to come back. And we got the report that two torpedoes were headed our way with a spread on them that was only about, I think it was around 30 feet wider than than the beam of our of our ship, in other words, the width of the ship. Yeah. Now our ship was like 900 feet long. I don't remember exactly what the width was, but the spread on these was was only about 30 feet wider than our beam. Everyone assumed we were going to get hit. Our ship had been torpedoed before this, before I came aboard, and everyone knew what a situation that was. Everyone braced for, for getting hit. And we, I thought, you know, this is it, they're gonna, they're gonna get us. But we had just started to make our turn. And as we got exactly parallel with this spread coming in, the torpedoes passed us one on either side of the ship going up. I have pictures of the two torpedoes going by our bow, one on either <laughs> either side. So we, <laughs> uh, that's we a, breathed. That's a, real. It sounds yeah. like a movie. Yeah, you couldn't, oh. uh, if, if you had written it, you wouldn't believe it, you know, because there was no way we could evade these. 
we were traveling at about three, three to four miles an hour, it, and it just happened that the timing was such that we just made the, the turn to, be, to get parallel with these rather than broadside, and one went up either side. Okay. So it was a, <laughs> that was our, our thrill of the day, you might say, at Okinawa. Uh, we, we missed all of the uh, kamikazes and we missed the torpedo. Incidentally, uh, we called in the uh, uh, destroyers, they dropped a bunch of depth charges and we saw this come up, it came up out of the water, the bow, and and went down. We we could see it uh, going. So we we saw the sub. We had sunk it. We didn't sink it, but our destroyer escorts did. Did everybody cheer? Oh yeah, yeah. It came up. We could see it come up out of the water, turn over, and go down. Oh boy. Yeah. What did it look like to see kamikazes coming at you, or even to a ship next <clears throat> to you? Well, <laughs> boy. Uh, Terrifying. Yeah. The problem was with the kamikaze that, that you don't realize is that many kamikazes were destroyed actually as they as they came at a ship. But unless you could knock them out of the air, they still kept coming. In other words, the they were destroyed, but they were they aimed at were aimed at you. And unless there was some way of diverting them, they they still uh, uh, came at you. And we and of course there were an awful lot of near misses on kamikazes. Not uh, I presume I don't know what their efficiency rate was, but it probably wasn't great. Uh, but of course once once one landed on you and they, and they all had uh, they were loaded with bombs. Why it, uh, it, it was pretty devastating. But a lot of ships sustained damage, the Indianapolis did, uh, sustained damage and still was able to operate. Then uh, you headed back for repairs? Well, we stayed <clears throat> until the pretty well Okinawa was secured. And then they sent the Indianapolis uh, and the Pensacola uh, back to Mare Island to have substantial uh, uh, battle damage repaired and they made some other modernizations to the Pensacola at the same time. It was a very, it was big because we had to move off the ship, we moved into barracks and uh, while they did this work. We were uh, side by side in dry docks uh, right together. That part was rather interesting because we had, there was a lot of competition uh, between uh, cruisers as to who had the best uh, basketball team and uh, softball team. We played all sorts of athletic events with them. I knew all of the uh, uh, men in my department aboard the aboard the Annapolis and, and then the officers got together at the officers club and uh, the drinks were cheap <laughs> and, and uh, so we became quite uh, friendly with with the guys on the on the Indianapolis and then there was a history about your next assignment right well <clears throat> yes uh, the the normal way that uh, these ships operated was they they had work done on them at uh, Mare Island, <clears throat> and then you went down to Hunter's Point, which is a naval base that was right in San Francisco, and you would get your kind of final tune up there, and then you went out for a two or three day shakedown cruise to make sure that everything worked. Uh, they had made some several major changes on the Pensacola. For instance, we used to have two catapults and they removed one catapult. So we only had one catapult now rather than two for our spotting planes. And uh, uh, we went to Hunter's Point and there we received the, our orders and our orders 
were to make a high-speed run to Guam with no stops. Um, no one understood what this meant. We kind of assumed that maybe it was going to be uh, a famous person uh, aboard. There was even rumors, yes, the president's going to go on and things of this sort. That, but we didn't know what it was. All we knew was it was a high-speed run to Guam. But we had to take our shakedown crews first. So we did. We went down uh, uh, to the uh, uh, near San Diego. There's a gunnery range uh, on one of the islands there. And unfortunately, while we were there, our new catapult that they just installed, uh, they had a, a malfunction and it blew, blew up. The explosive somehow didn't perform properly and it uh, blew up. And uh, so uh, we limped back. It, it was no major damage to the ship, but it was going to take uh, maybe several weeks to repair this. In the meantime, uh, the Indianapolis followed us to Hunter's Point uh, a couple days later, and because we were unable to do it, they switched our orders, and uh, the Indianapolis took our high-speed run to Guam, and their orders had been to go to Alaska. Uh, we took the Alaska run then, and they took the high-speed run to Guam, which uh, we now know was to deliver the atomic bomb to Mare Island. Of course, at that time we'd never heard of atomic bomb, so we didn't we didn't know what it was. But of course, then uh, after that, as you know, the Indianapolis uh, uh, was assigned to go down to the Philippines, and it was during this time that the tragic uh, event mm -hmm. happened when they lost uh, the ship and and many of the, of the crew. Meantime, we were sitting up in Alaska waiting to go into the northern segment of Japan uh, for the final invasion. Were, were you online when the atomic bomb was dropped and uh, how did you hear about that and what were some of the reactions on the ship? Well, we yes, we got the uh, uh, word that the bomb had been dropped uh, on Hiroshima. No one really understood what the atomic bomb meant. Uh, we had never heard the term before, but it mentioned the tremendous devastation and so forth. I believe it was August 2nd. I, 7th. I mean. 7th, was yeah, it? Yeah, it was in that summer. early August. Right. And uh, uh, yeah, we were shocked. We we didn't know what it was. We we at that moment we didn't think it was the end of the war, and we had uh, gotten a new admiral aboard, Admiral Jack Fletcher, uh, and we were to take over the northern third of the Japanese islands. They had divided it into three segments. We were the and we were assembling in Alaska to do this. But no, I I don't. Uh, we, we didn't know enough about the atomic bomb to, to recognize. Then, of course, the other cities that got it, I believe Nagasaki. Hiroshima. Hiroshima. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, each time why it, it became more evident to us that this was something really big. Yeah. And, of course, then the capitulation and, and, and it was over. Then you went into Japan then? Uh, yes, we took over the northern uh, segment of Japan and uh, we had a very interesting experience there in that uh, <clears throat> we were we landed at a town called uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the little port we were to go uh, the, the the orders were that no US money was to go ashore, okay. and as a supply, a fleet, I was a fleet dispersing officer. Uh, my orders were to go to Omanado and at the bank and pick up this tremendous amount of money. So, 
we went into town and found out how you got to Omanado, which was a little train ride, not very far. And we took the train into Omanado. We picked up this money. I had uh, three or four Marine guards with me. And uh, we came back. The ship didn't think much of it. Well, then about three days later, the Marines came in and made this tremendous landing there as if no one had ever been there before. We'd been there two or three days prior to this and up to the bank at Omanato. And, uh, but I remember kidding the Marines about the fact that we'd been, we'd been up there on the train and got the money, and now they were making a big deal of the landing at Omanato. When you got on the Japanese mainland, did you have an interpreter, or how could you go into a bank and get all that money? Was it just... They had word. They had word, apparently, from their government okay. that they were to have this available for the U.S. Navy. And uh, there was no problem. They, uh, they understood it. Most of those people that you could communicate with, uh, even though they did, most of them had enough English. Uh, we had no Japanese. Yeah. We did have some Japanese interpreters, but as I recall, there was none that went with us that day. Oh. Uh, uh, it was enough so we could, they understood when we came in the bank with three or four Marines and so forth, they knew what we were there for. I'm going to, uh, we're getting to the point where we're ending the combat phase of uh, your life. Uh, was there something very memorable of that or something that stood out that you, as you look back on it now that's still very fresh in your mind? Well, of course, the, the, uh, the thing at, at Iwo would be the most uh, impressionable. Uh, because of the number of deaths and, and people injured uh, and, and probably the other exciting thing would, be, would have been the submarine attack that we had at, at, at Okinawa. Uh, th those two things, I suppose, would be the thing that I would remember the most. Uh, you mentioned, did Jack Fletcher, was he was he in command of your ship? Were there, were there some officers above or leadership that made an impression on you during that wartime period that you men or worked under or with? Well, we had uh, uh, Cruiser Division 5, which we were in, had a, a, an admiral, as a, and that was, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that was Rear Admiral Denebrink was his name a very uh, proper Annapolis uh, man that I worked for. Uh, at the end of the, uh, or near the end of the war, uh, Vice Admiral Jack Fletcher, they called him Mad Jack Fletcher, uh, didn't, he did not come aboard our ship, but he was in command of our group that was going to be the northern group that was going to go into the northern segment of Japan. And he was in charge uh, directly under, I'm not sure whether at that point it was Bull Halsey uh, or Admiral Spruance. They traded off being commander of the Pacific Fleet. I'm, I'm not sure at the end of the war, I think it was Admiral Spruance that Jack Fletcher would have been under. I did see him, but I didn't have much contact with him. Well, then the ship came back. Uh, the war was over, and uh, what happened to the ship, and then where did you step off into your after-the-war life? Well, uh, at the end of the war, a group of ships were slated to go to Ulithi uh, to undergo a big atomic bomb test. They wanted to test the effectiveness of, the, of our atomic bomb against ships, and the Pensacola, uh, being one of the older cruisers, uh, was slated to go to Ulithi. And uh, at that time we were given a choice. Uh, we could go with the ship and, decommi and decommission the ship there, and then we would stand by f for the test. We would see the atomic bomb test, 
uh, and then come back. Or if we chose not to do that, uh, we could be reassigned. And uh, my choice was uh, to not do that. And uh, so uh, I was reassigned to uh, the naval base uh, at, at Great Lakes. And so I was sent back to Great Lakes and I spent uh, several months there before I was discharged. All during uh, World War II, uh, did you have some home correspondence uh, with your bride-to-be or where did you meet her and how did that come about and well, her maiden name? Well, I had not met my future wife, uh, who was Dorothy Ann Murphy, uh, who came from Champaign, Illinois, and had gone to school at the University of Illinois. Uh, she was, uh, uh, I got my first job in Chicago after being discharged from uh, uh, Great Lakes, and uh, she was working for a bank uh, in the loop and uh, one of uh, our mutual friends uh, uh, arranged a blind date and uh, we met that way. But this was after all of the war was over. I did not know her at all during that time. About my only major correspondence uh, during the time was with my mother. And uh, it's rather interesting, I wish maybe she had saved some of the letters because all of our letters were, of course, censored by other officers, but I had a little code where the beginning of each paragraph, the letter would spell something out as to where I was. And I remember writing the one on Iwo Jima, where I started each paragraph with an I and then W and O, and it spelled out Iwo Jima. And she told me when she got me, she said, I, I didn't. I thought you must have misspelled it. I've never heard of Iwo Jima, <laughs> and, and, but anyway, she had destroyed all those letters. So, what was your mother's name? Uh, well, my mother's name was Ethel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it had been Ethel Gillette, and she became uh, Ethel Van Nest. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, your uh, the result of the marriage. How many children and grandchildren do you have now? Well, uh, we had three children, uh, two boys and uh, a girl, and each of them have two children, a boy and a girl. So I have three boy grandchildren and three girl grandchildren, a total of six. And had you started your own business then, or on your business career, how did that go? No, I. I, I, I came to work, I don't know if I should mention the company, but I, I went to work in Chicago. Uh, actually, it was in the legal department of the Walgreen Company. Uh, I was not a lawyer, uh, but a real estate negotiator, and uh, uh, that was part of the legal department, and we negotiated the leases. I remember the first lease that I negotiated was in LaGrange, Illinois, which was an old uh, a jewel, a jewel store on the main street that uh, uh, we converted into a Walgreens drugstore. And uh, I worked there for uh, until I got married. And at the time I got married, we decided that it was not the right place for me because it involved 100% travel time. And so we went back to Minneapolis, and I went to work for ADM Corporation uh, as a sales and an analyst. And uh, then after that, I left, did two or three different things, one of which led me back to Chicago, uh, working with a company developing some farm implements. And uh, the company was then sold, and uh, I could either go with a new corporation or leave. And I decided not to go with the new one. And at that point, I, uh, I started my own business. That was in 1953. 
And what business was that? What uh, did you specialize in? Well, I became in? really at the initially a manufacturer's agent uh, that later uh, led into uh, being more of an exclusive distributor of uh, products in the ventilation uh, field uh, that were sold to commercial and industrial uh, on commercial industrial jobs. And uh, that company is, uh, in fact, there were several companies that resulted from that. Uh, we had a company that manufactured air filters. It was a separate company. And then we had a, a distribution company. And those companies are still in operation today. Uh, I sold later both of these companies to the employees. And uh, they still operate them and they're still going along very successfully. Yeah. I have to express a, a personal knowledge on this and uh, I really would like to uh, ask you as uh, a, a long time supporter of your favorite uh, activity, golf. Did you play any golf during World War II on any of the islands? No. Or where did you start your major commitment to the golf, uh, uh, the game of golf? I had played some golf as a uh, teenager uh, back in Wyndham. And I remember we had our old sand greens where we used to have to pull the mat behind us and, and smooth out the green. I played a little golf then. I didn't play any golf then until I was really married and uh, started uh, to play. And then when I came back to uh, Chicago, uh, later, I joined uh, LaGrange Country Club and uh, got involved with the grounds committee. And through that, uh, I was asked to go on the Chicago District uh, Board on their grounds committee and later on the USGA grounds committee. And uh, it just kind of evolved, uh, but it was all after I uh, had started work and it was not during well, the I, It should be recorded, I, I believe, that you were officer in the Chicago district and also the USGA and you ran tournaments and you might mention those. Well I brought the 1974 uh, uh, USGA Women's Open Championship to LaGrange and I was chairman of it uh, that year. Uh, we did as you remember have it again in 1981. Uh, I, I became very interested in, in course rating, and I was chairman of the course rating committee for the Chicago District for 14 years. I did work my way up through the ladder, and I, be, and I was president of the Chicago District Golf Association in 1982 and 3. Uh, I also went on the championship rules committee for the U.S. Golf Association, and I served on that uh, committee for approximately 20 years, uh, retiring in 1991. Your other uh, hobbies that I'm aware of that you're, you're excellent at is number one is photography, and you're also a world traveler, and you might mention I think you had a travel agency at one point. I had a ownership, part ownership in a travel agency, which did give me access to traveling a lot. I've always been interested in, in photography, and so the two things kind of uh, went together. I, I, I did a lot of traveling, and I did a lot of golf traveling. I actually either played golf or saw golf played in about 56 countries, so I, I got around the world. I played some golf on all continent, including Antarctica, where I took a sawed-off uh, five iron when I went to Antarctica and uh, and hit a few golf balls. So that was my that was the last of the continents that I hadn't played. So I I did get to play a lot of golf and travel. It all kind of fit together. <clears throat> did you ever go back to Okinawa and Iwo Jima and see it? Uh, on the side where you were bombing or bombarding it? 
Uh, I got on Iwo Jima one time. We came back through there, and uh, there was a supply depot there, and I did get to go ashore uh, at Iwo Jima. And uh, I was not there for a long period of time, maybe four or five hours. And during that time, I got some of the Navy personnel to drive me around and I did get to go up uh, Mount Suribachi, and uh, I did, it's not a very big island, so you can see it rather quickly, but I did see all the honeycombed uh, uh, battlements and, and the hospital rooms and everything that they had dug underground. Being a volcanic uh, origin, it was easy to build caves, and and. A lot of those are still there. Now, of course, there's no one that can go there now. Uh, they won't let anyone ashore anymore at this point. What would you like the young people and uh, of today to remember about World War II as a veteran from that period? Well, it, it certainly was uh, one of the great moments in in our history. It it it. It was certainly the, the, the greatest war. Uh, I think it's easy for the young people probably to forget it, uh, it being not actively involved with it. Uh, I, I think that uh, our generation that was in that war should certainly be remembered by the young people. It, it, I, I don't know if there's any one thing about the war other than it was an all-consuming thing that everybody was involved with. Bob, on behalf of the Palm Springs Air Museum, yeah. we thank you very much. We're proud of you as a veteran mm -hmm. and are privileged to record this. Thank you. Well, you can edit this, I presume, or can you? Uh, we, you? we will edit it. There will be yeah. some editing and yeah. you'll see the notes and everything before it goes in the Library of Congress or yeah. uh, to the Palm Springs Air Museum, which you can come over and see us and then go to the museum and see that. Yeah. Uh, we're adding a trailer on Robert Van Ness history to show some of the black and white pictures that were taken by your ship photographer. Correct. And he's going to give us a description on that. We're recording. This is uh, your ship. Would you please name her and describe just a little bit about it? Well, this is a, a heavy cruiser, the USS Pensacola, CA-24. And uh, this is uh, at the end of the war. Uh, this is when we're at anchor in Alaska. There's a handsome lad. Who is that? And well, how old are you? <laughs> that, that's... When I was uh, on my station, uh, uh, my my watch station, uh, I had a watch every day like everybody else, and uh, that's just the normal way of going to my watch. Cool. This is on uh, duty, right? Full combat gear? Yes, that, that'd be on the same station. Uh, when you're in the combat mode, correct. What's the whole story here? Well, <clears throat> that's the hole made in uh, in our deck uh, by uh, a a three. I believe it was a three-inch shell armor piercing that uh, did not in, explode on contact and uh, dropped down a deck into our CIC. Uh, where it did extensive damage. How close were you to the enemy shelling you from the m mountainside? You mean the ship? Right. Uh, we were about 2,000 yards. Right. Yeah. This is another view. It shows about where you were standing. Well, no, I was inside the bulkhead to the left. I, I was not on out on the deck at that time. I was in the decoding room, which is just uh, in the, inside the bulkhead here. So I was probably maybe four or five feet from where it actually went through the deck. But this is where you got your Purple Heart. 
Uh, yes, it was uh, the shrapnel as a result of that explosion. This is a special shot of operations. What's going on? Well, that's our uh, spotting plane being uh, going off the catapult. Uh, I believe that's an OS-2U that we had at the time. Naval aviation is a dangerous field and people don't realize it. And here's an example of what can happen on a catapult. What happened, Bob? Well, this is where we had our new catapult and it misfired somehow and it, uh, it tossed the plane off the catapult, but not at a speed uh, uh, fast enough for it to take the air. And it turned over and we actually lost the plane. Did you get the plane back on a cruiser that didn't have a landing deck? Well, the, the uh, plane landed and came up onto what was called a sled that uh, uh, caught the pontoon and then the plane was brought over and lifted back uh, aboard uh, with a crane back onto the catapult. There is a hook right underneath the front of the pontoon, a black hook, and it's just like fishing for a huge whale to get it on that rope sled. This is a historic picture. What is it, Bob? Well, that's a picture taken from our spotting plane, and it's uh, it, right in the center of the picture is uh, uh, the flag that was raised uh, above Suribachi. This is right after the, the famous uh, flag raising that uh, you've seen the statues of. I may wipe it out with that light, but can you point to Just take your finger and point to it. I well, think it's, it's right. right. It's right here. Yep, that's it. Is, is, the, is the flag. Whoop, there's one that fades out. Okay, we got... That makes it awful bright in there to see. I think we're picking up pretty good the way it looks for the other yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Oh, recording. I didn't shut it off. Oh, they'll edit that out. There we. Here we go. Who's this? Well, that's just some of my fellow uh, officers. Uh, just for informal. And, shot where, of us. and where are you? Well, I'm in the center, okay. wearing the cap. Okay. I'll waste a little bit on that one. And what's this? Well, this is in uh, Japan. Uh, it, it's some of the same fellows that were in the other picture uh, when we went ashore and we gave candy and gum to all the little kids that we saw on the street. I'm the one handing out the, the gum, as you see there, the little kid. They look pretty happy. They don't look like they were too disturbed about having Americans there. No, it, it, the funny thing was we didn't find any animosity at all once we went in. I thought we would, but we never did. Well, oh, Officer Wilmots, and where are you in this? Or can you find yourself? I don't know. I don't think you could probably do it. It's, uh, i got to stop. I, I, whoops. That was taken uh, near the end of the war. It was a, it, it was our officer compliment. We had about uh, close to a hundred officers aboard ship. And to wind up with veteran Bob Van Ness in the center with a tie and a hat. Who are these people? Well, that was my division, the S division. I'm standing there in the center, and then to the right are the two uh, chief petty officers that were also yeah. in that division. And what was the duty of the division? Well, it was the supply division. We handled uh, all of the uh, uh, food, and, uh, all the supplies for the ship, including uh, food. And uh, also, we were a fleet dispersing uh, officer so that I paid uh, 
uh, people on ships that did not have a dispersing officer aboard.